Welcome back to Untaming Masculinity, the podcast where we tackle issues relevant to men and their journeys to reclaim their masculinity. I'm Dan, and as always, I'm joined by my co-host and good friend, Brad. What's going on today? Not much, man. My my friend and I went to a Brazilian steakhouse last night. It's one of those all-you-can-eat ones where they bring out the meat on the skewers. And uh, I ate way too much meat, and I'm feeling it this morning. But <laughs> other than that, I'm doing well. How are you? Doing pretty good. It's been a busy week. Uh, lots of changes at work and at home in terms of uh, my wife's got a promotion on the horizon here, and uh, I've been filling out my team a little bit. So it's been a little bit of chaos, but a lot of fun. Um, a lot of good things happening. So today, we've got a special guest, Father Michael Butler. Father Michael has been a priest in the Orthodox Church for the last 27 years. During that time, he's been heavily involved in the in men's work, especially in the areas of rites of passage, masculine archetype, sacred space, time, and initiation. Uh, and we'll explore a lot of those on today's show. And uh, he's also a bodybuilder. So that'll be something interesting to dig into. So welcome to the show, Father Michael. Thank you. Glad to be here. So why don't we start with you just telling the guys a little bit about yourself, and then we can start to dig into some of the topics that we that we want to talk about. Okay. Yeah, for sure. Uh, as you said, I am, a, I am a priest in the Orthodox Church. I've been a priest for 27 years. Um, it's my joy. I really love my work. Uh, I, I love especially working with young men. And for some reason, there's been this huge influx of young men into the Orthodox Church all over North America uh, over about the past year or so. It's it's an interesting phenomenon as to why they're coming and what they're looking for and all, but uh, I feel uniquely placed to help deal with it. Uh, I've worked done men's work and studied it for about three decades now. So I, I think between pastoral skills and my interest in men's work, I have something uh, to say to them. Uh, I am married. I, uh, my wife and I have been married for 37 years. I have two adult sons. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm 61 years old now. So yeah, when you mention the bodybuilding thing, you know, I, I hope <laughs> your listeners are, are not imagining Arnold. Uh, I'm too old for that. You have to take into account that things get, <laughs> you know, don't work nearly as well the older that you get. But, uh, you know, I, I don't look bad for a 61 year old man. And uh, I've um, I found the I found the Iron Council and have become much more involved in online men's work in the, about the last three and a half years. Uh, my own uh, involvement in online men's work has expanded since then. I'm also associated with Manifesto, which is a Scandinavian men's organization, the Saint Paisios Brotherhood, which is an online Orthodox men's organization, uh, and I'm looking to develop my own personal coaching practice. Uh, to where I can bring sort of the unique skills that I think I have to a larger audience of men and do what I can to help men to become the best that they can be. And that's sort of like the bottom line with me. I just want to help men become the best that they can be. See that that's a that's a fantastic story. And that's that's some really fascinating background. The the question I have for you is what what drew you to the priesthood? You know, you it sounds like you'd been married for a few years when that happened. Oh, yeah. What was uh, uh no i was, was uh, uh yeah in orthodoxy you have to be married before okay. you can be ordained okay that, yeah. that makes sense Apologies yeah you can't be trolling your congregation for a wife that's just <laughs> cool. that makes sense so, what was the, what was the, what did that journey look like for you um i had uh it, it goes back to my childhood i lost my dad when i was eight uh mama remarried but that was sort of the primary trauma you know in my childhood and my stepdad was okay. And mama said, I, you know, I put my nose in a Bible and never took it out, which I don't remember it being like that. I remember mom was Catholic and I remember enjoying going to mass. But when dad died, mama got mad at God and quit going to church. And I, I continued to want to go. Uh, my stepdad moved us out of the, you know, the, the town I grew up in. We moved down to South Texas on the Mexican border. And uh, I fell into a bad crowd and got to stealing from the school and got caught. And uh, I went to confession, really, for the first time in my life. Um, I was 15 years old. I remember it like it was yesterday. It was February the 4th, 1975 at 4.55 in the afternoon. It was a Friday. And the confession, I don't remember, honestly, except that I was on the verge of tears. And thank God the priest on the other side of the little screen realized he had, you know, a, a young man on the edge. And he was very gentle with me. But I walked out of that church. 
And remember, this is South Texas, so it's semi-tropical. So, you know, February the 4th is really pretty mild. It's about 60 degrees outside. And I walked down the sidewalk and suddenly the entire world changed. The light went golden. I heard the sound that creation sings to its creator. Don't ask me to describe it. I, I, I couldn't begin to. And I knew in an instant that there was a God, that he was personal and that he loved me. And it turned me inside out. And we're talking here today as a result of that, that one encounter. So, you know, when you're a, a good little Catholic boy, you know, if you want to be religious, you become a priest. And I, I had this, this burden on my heart that I really wanted to do that. Uh, later on in college, uh, I discovered the Orthodox Church my senior year in college and, and converted to Orthodoxy. And for a little while, the desire went away, but it came back. And so you know, the whole priesthood thing, I think, is out of gratitude for one particular moment uh, when God showed himself to me. And uh, I, I seem to have done okay with it. Um, my parishes grow. I have good rapport you know, with my people. And I think I have something to offer along those lines. And as I said earlier, I really enjoy my work. I love pretty much every aspect of it, I, especially, you know, not only standing at the altar and doing the liturgical part, you know, when when it's sort of big and public and 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 beautiful, but one on one with people over a cup of coffee or a, or a good craft beer, I do excellent work one on one like that. And really, to have the freedom in the week to sit down with people like that and 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 hear about their lives and see what support and help I can offer is really one of the greatest joys that I have. I loved how you said that this is all that you've done is out of gratitude. Mm -hmm. That was, that was beautiful. Um, so obviously you had mentioned a little earlier, and this is something I kind of want to dive into is how you've mentioned that there are a lot of young men that have joined mm -hmm. the Orthodox church in the last year. Mm -hmm. Do you have any ideas to why? Like, do you have any theories, any suspicions? Uh, yeah, there's a, there is, are some common themes for what they're doing. And like I say, I've, I've got maybe two dozen in my congregation. I know the cathedral in our cathedral in Dallas has got over 40. Wow. I talk to priests around the country. They're, they're like coming out of the woodwork all over the place. And I think it's a combination of things. One is that they're looking for truth with a capital T and orthodoxy is known for being, you know, real hard ass Christian faith. If you want the Marines of Christianity, you come to the orthodox. That's, that's just it. You know, we're, we we had no reformation. We didn't really do the enlightenment, you know, or the modern project. So a lot of what we do, you know, is very archetypal and a very a very old understanding of things, which which has a lot of depth and, a, and there's a lot of meaning uh, to everything that we do. So I think they're looking for truth with a capital T. They're looking for structure, which we have in abundance. They're looking for stability because we don't change. You know, the old joke: How many Orthodox does it take to change a light bulb? <laughs> change you know <laughs> we, you know for us it's glacially slow which is you know both a blessing and a curse but you know they're, they're you know they're tired of churches that are either in step with the times or five minutes behind the times panting to catch up okay and that is not us and i think also uh yeah they're looking for like i say truth with a capital t but some real depth and meaning and a christian expression that asks something of them and orthodoxy is really rather demanding and what we ask of people, and they just revel, particularly in the structure and in finding a rule of prayer that they keep every single day, and the cycle of services, and the cycle of fasting, and being accountable to a spiritual father. It's much more personal, the relationship with the pastor, than it is in most Western Protestant and Catholic confessions. Uh, and also, I think they're, they're all like between 25 and 35, maybe. And I think part it's part of a larger issue in their lives where they realize that 15 to 20 years of smoking weed, playing video games and jerking off to porn is not a real good preparation for life. You know, and so they're coming out of what late, late adolescence into early adulthood and they realize they don't have the skills they need. They don't know how to talk to women. They don't know how to have a, a, a good relationship with a woman. They're, you know, crippled with college debt or, you know, they can't get, they're not financially stable enough yet. So they see a lot of lack in themselves and they're looking to turn over a new leaf, to have a new beginning, to make a new start. And in part, if they have a religious sentiment or a, or, or, or a sense, they come looking for a church that will meet that as well. So a lot of the work that I do 
with the young men is not just religious education and, and spirituality and stuff, but it's a lot of the same kind of life lessons that we talk about in the Iron Council. You know, it's accountability, it's structure, it's getting your shit together. You know, for the young ones who are still at home living in the basement, you need to get out and get a job and that sort of stuff. And they eat it up. And because I have so many, they form their own community. So there's a lot of spontaneous mutual support for them. And, uh, they, you know, they're, they're finding they're finding a good environment where they can grow and, you know, and begin to feel really good about themselves. And I, it, it happens over and over and over again. It's a great joy and a real blessing to work with them. That's, that's really interesting. The, the fact that the, the, the word structure, you hit on a couple of times. Structure. And yes. I think that that is, I think you're onto something there in terms of the fact that where we are in the world with men, especially that there, there is not a lot of structure early on. Yeah. And and by by presenting this in a in a facet of life where they can, for lack of a better term, kind of compartmentalize it at first, mm. and just be present in the church and be and have that structure, and then be able to use that to build it outwards into the rest of their life is a really strong motivation. So I think that's pretty cool. Thank you, thank you. It seems to be working. Yeah, and I think you're right. I mean, even I mean, even from the the architecture of an Orthodox temple. I mean, they're varied, but there is kind of a, a, a standard format that very much makes you feel like you have a place. Mm -hmm. and you are in the right place. And when you are in the correct place, it, the, the, the church is built like a microcosm. So, you know, God is up in the, Christ is up in the dome in the heavens, and there are the angels up there, and then the icons of the saints on all the walls, and we stand on the floor. But when you find your correct place, in an Orthodox temple, it helps to situate you spiritually and psychologically in the right place in the world. And it, it helps to constellate and, and solidify the personality a little bit. You, you just feel at peace and you feel yourself when you're in there. And everything that we do sort of helps to reinforce that and to get back to who is, you know, the, the natural man that we're created to be, mm -hmm. which we'll touch on again later. So what's so fascinating about that to me, Father Michael, is there are these men, these young men, we we grow up in a society where we're told it's okay to live a life a godless life it's okay to watch porn it's okay to smoke a lot of weed and all these men find themselves almost devoid of purpose mm -hmm. and it seems as if they're finding their way to church back to god to find that purpose mm -hmm. and that to me suggests that that is a divinely masculinity and manliness are divinely created attributes these are things that God has instilled in us. Yep. And not just in, in sort of a, a simplistic way. I think you're, you're, you're absolutely right on an ontological or a hardware kind of level. Because when you're talking about looking for meaning and for purpose, by and large, it's because most of most young men are like we all started out as hedonists and narcissists. We're all wrapped up in ourselves. You know, and an eventually life requires us to turn our attention outward. And uh I think the difference between an immature and a mature masculinity is precisely that. That a mature masculinity is, is, is there. First of all, our masculinity is gifted to us by God, but we in turn give our masculinity and our masculine gifts outward to the rest of the world. And that's the point where they're, where they're coming up short. They're not offering their lives as a gift to other people and they're tired of sort of the self-centeredness of it. And they know it's not enough. They know they have something to give. They know they want to give something. They know they have value to provide to the world or to other people, and they don't know how to do it. And I think that is is very much hardwired into us. Yes, God himself is giving and, um, you know, superabundant goodness, you know, to use one of the classical terms for that. Uh, but we're designed to be giving. And if you think about it, you can see very Christian terms, you know, two great commandments, love of God, love of neighbor, that takes your attention off yourself and puts it on God and on your neighbor. And when you can get your, you know, really your attention off of yourself and quit living just for yourself alone, but for living for others, that's where real meaning comes in. You know, maybe you find a woman, you get married, you get stretched a little, now you have to put up with a wife and then eventually you decide you want children. And now that's real hard for some guys, you know, but it, it, it stretches our heart a little more, you know? And so now instead of just living for ourselves, we live for our wives, we live for our kids. You know, and then this funny thing happens, your kids get to be up four or five years old. And next thing you know, you start wanting to be a scoutmaster or you start wanting to coach little league or soccer. Next thing you know, caring for your own kids isn't enough. Now you care for everybody else's kids. 
And I think it's part of God's design to take us out of our self-focused, narcissistic, egotistical little selves when we start out young and to dilate our hearts out until eventually, maybe, maybe, by the time we get to be old, we can love everybody, uh, you know, uh, even equally, which is, I think, what God wants us to do. And so I think it's even built, hard-baked into the progress of most men's lives that uh, we learn to do that through the ordinary course of growing up and, and settling down. Uh, but it's genuinely true. All of these young men, they're desperate for something to do. They want they want to matter. They want their lives to matter. They want their lives to have meaning. They know they've got to give something. And in, too often, they're kind of lost as to what they have to offer, how they can give it. So if I can get them turned away from themselves and turned outward, even if it's just finding something small to do in the church. I, I had this young man show up three weeks ago on Sunday. Brand new, not Orthodox. First time he stepped into an Orthodox church, pie-eyed. They have a beautiful temple that's completely frescoed from floor to ceiling. You know, I have a large choir of about two dozen people. They just sound magnificent. So the whole thing is just big and loud and beautiful. And, and you know, as Dostoevsky says, beauty will save the world. And we're going to lead the charge on that one. They just bowled over by what he saw. And, of course, some of my other young guys saw, ah, fresh meat. And they went over and they grabbed him, you know, and they pulled him over to the group of young men and all. And he stick around for coffee hour. He sat down at the table with the other young guy. They're just chatting up a storm. You know, coffee hour is over. And I find this guy. He's in the kitchen washing dishes now, you know, cleaning coffee cups and all. And I thought, you know, this is it. He came looking for something. He found a place to give. Of course, he was back the next week. You know, if you find places for guys to plug in and give them, even if it's even if it's washing dishes, they've got something to contribute and they're better for it. Sorry, I get in, I get excited about this stuff. No, that was incredibly that was, inspiring. Yeah, yeah, that was that was really inspiring. It, it, I was actually going to ask you how you you harness these guys and kind of get them into the mindset of giving back, but that was a, a beautiful example of how yeah. it, it almost happens innately. It, it happens mm -hmm. kind of spontaneously, and I've talked enough. Some of my some of the young men who have been around for a couple of three or four or five years, you know, I've sort of turned up and says, "Keep your eyes out for the new guys." Y'all are the ones who are going to shepherd them. You're the ones who are going to stand in the church. You're going to see them. So you loop them in. You bring them to coffee hour. You find them a place to plug in. And, you know, it, it takes a huge burden off of my shoulders to do it. And again, then the other young men, now that's their job. They're watching out for the new guys and they're stepping up and helping them. So when they can, when it's peer to peer like that, it works even better because I'm paid and ordained to be nice to new people, right? <laughs> you know, it's my job. And so even though I can do it, it seems more authentic when somebody who's not paid and ordained to do it does it. So, yeah, it's been working real well for us. There were several light bulb moments as you were going through those various scenarios that I've seen in my life. And it draws us back. You know, everybody who's a first time parent, you know, you're always told you'll never know true love until that baby's put in your arms. You feel that. That's one of the first, obviously, when the day you get married. You start to feel you need to love and provide for somebody else. You need to forget about yourself. When that baby who's innocent and wholly reliant on you is put in your arms, you see a lot more into that window. And it's interesting yeah. to see that evolution and how it applies elsewhere in men's lives. And I think of us in our work in the Iron Council. Once you've been in the Iron Council long enough, you stop focusing on yourself and you become very focused on the outcomes of the other men around you. That's right. And uh, that's why I'm still there. It was the way it was put to me when I first joined, you come for yourself, but you stay for the others. Yeah. Exactly. And it's been absolutely true. I won't say I, I don't I I don't get anything out of the Iron Council. I get less sort of personally because like I said, I've been around for nearly three years and a lot of the kind of basic work that we emphasize, I've been able to do. And I was doing some of it before I joined the IC anyway. But get myself into a mentor's position where I can help help out some other teams where I can work with some other battle team leaders, you know, where I can still help out on my own battle team. Uh, yeah, there's the real reward. And uh, there are more and more, again, younger men who are coming in who are still sort of figuring stuff out, still trying to find a vision for their lives, still working on a mission or something. And every so often, a little elder wisdom can drip through and uh, offer some a leg up. So it's immensely gratifying to watch. My own younger son, Joined the Iron Council. He was in this last cohort that just started. He just got on to a battle team a couple of three weeks ago, and he's loving it. I, I couldn't be prouder. You know, just because I, I know the benefit that it will have from the accountability and the camaraderie with other men. 
you know, it's a, it's a huge blessing. Most men, we forget those of us who are in good communities and good battle teams like what we have, we forget how many, how few men in the world have a, a good group of men that they can rely on, that they can open their hearts to, that they can, that have their back. And so many don't have that. And yeah, it's unfortunate. It's unfortunate. I wouldn't trade it for anything. That That's a powerful message too. We, we talk about it a lot on the show about how, you know, there are a lot of men in the world who try to go the lone wolf mentality, the lone wolf way. And having a group of men who you can be solely reliant on and they're reliant on you and you just, you form that pack. Mm-hmm. It is just such a strong way to, to grow as a man. And, you know, you talked mm-hmm. about how you've got your new guys in the church who are looking for, for fresh blood. And yeah. um, it, that, that speaks exactly to that, that premise of just building that core group, building that, that pack of men mm-hmm. who are just going to be relying upon each other and who have each other's backs. It's as a man, it's such a strong feeling to know that somebody else is there for you and that you can, you can be open with them and you can share with them and you don't have to be always have the, the big tough guy persona that, you know, you mm-hmm. can, you can bear the brunt of the world on your own two shoulders and that's it. So that's yeah, it. But we, it, we a try. Yeah. Yeah. Men try un, until it fails. Yeah. yeah. We can do it for a little while. Yep. Yeah. I'm always drawn to Christ. I mean, Jesus Christ, when he was on this earth, he intentionally sought out disciples. He needed men to walk with him. He needed these men as well. So if he needed them, <laughs> we sure mm-hmm. do. Yeah. But again, to ask for help. See, and, and there's a thing because it requires it requires an admission of weakness or an admission of need. Yeah. And a lot of guys are just too afraid to, to let down the guard even that much and say, hey, buddy, I could use some help with this. It was too often, you know, for a lot of guys, they see a weakness and they go right after it. And mm-hmm. so a lot, a lot of men have been burned and hurt. I have too, uh, unfortunately, you know, and opening my heart in circumstances where I thought I could trust other men around me and discovered that the trust was misplaced. Uh, sometimes, you know, there are guys who get burned too badly and just can't open up or, or won't, you know, out of fear of being betrayed again. But uh, if you can get past it, yeah, we're, we're not designed to do this alone. First thing that God said was not good was for men to be alone. And if y'all are both married, then you know that there are some things that it's best that we don't take to our women. Yeah. And it's best if we have another guy that we can talk to and go sit down and, and hack this out with another guy rather than take it to our wives. And yeah, yeah, we, we function much better that way. <laughs> you know, straight out of, you know, Jack Donovan, you know, the way of men, you know, talking about his, uh, what was it? It's his, uh, not quite a tribe, the little clan, the little group, the, the war band. I forget the word he uses, you know, is the, alt, is, is the optimum. Uh, group for men, which is about eight to fifteen, which is you know, which is why we 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 set up our our battle teams that way. Mm-hmm. That's really fascinating. One one interesting tidbit that I, I've been drawn to as you've been speaking is in my church. Um, there's a men's group, and mm-hmm. within that men's group, there's a leader who got up one day and he was sharing a lot of this message: men, we need each other. Men, if you look to the guy to your left, the guy to your right. You don't know what they're going through. So Mm -hmm. he's made a point every Sunday for us to intentionally spend some time to go out and meet these men within our group that we've yet to introduce ourselves to. And he said it very succinctly. He's like, men, the reason I'm having you do this is because I'm going through hard things in my life. And I know that I need you because I've made this realization. I'm sure there are lots of men in the same room who need that. Mm -hmm. They, They feel alone. They feel as if they have burdens that they can't overcome and they don't know where to begin to go to address that. So many men are scared of being, you know, we hate the term vulnerable, but you're exposing a part of your soul that yeah. can seem intimidating. It can seem scary. It's like, yes. what if I put myself out there and somebody rejects me? Yeah. And the act of doing that and learning to become comfortable with that is really the foundation, in my opinion, of brotherhood. Yeah, because it's an immense amount of trust. And if you can find a group of men with whom you can be intimate, and you know, and I, and I mean that in a hard way, not a physical way. Uh, it's a pity you have to qualify that nowadays. Uh, but whom you can open your heart to and precisely be vulnerable is a group that you know that that you trust enough that you will not be ridiculed, you will not be shamed, you'll not be laughed at, and have a group of men that you can be around like that and take just about anything. And it, it grows with time and it grows with practice. I mean, even in my own ministry, I, I know this is, I've pastored three churches, and in every case, it's been 
usually three to five years that I'm there before people will really begin to open up, like in confession, for example, and tell me what's really going on. You know, it just takes a while to establish the trust that you have. And so the longer you can be with a group of guys, the better it is. You know, and and to see how well our battle teams on the Iron Council function, though I've seen guys, you know, three meetings in, four meetings in, and they're already spilling their guts. And it, it points to the fact of how desperate men are for a forum where, you know, something, a safe space where they can do that and the trust that they have in the, in the other men in the team. You know, it, it's just a beautiful thing. Let's change gears a little bit. I want to know a little bit about your, your bodybuilding journey. <laughs> we can get back to the, uh, the religious stuff here in, in a minute, but I'm curious to see what kind of got you down that path and, and, and maybe how you even tie it into the work that you do. Okay. <laughs> um, I'm going to date myself here. Uh, I don't know if you guys, I, I read comic books as a boy. Do you remember the Charles Atlas ads in the back of the comic, but the guy getting sand kicked in his face? Yep. You, 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 okay. That's what got me. I was about eight years old. And I said, I want to look like that. And I always thought it was beautiful. Uh, but after my dad died, um, I was kind of the depressed kid and I was, I, I gained a lot of weight. So I was the fat kid, the awkward kid, the kid who almost failed second grade because he was so uncoordinated. He couldn't jump a rope. Um, the kid who was always, always picked last for team sports. I don't like team sports to this day. Okay. Um, awkward and all. And so I always wanted to look good like that. And I was intimidated. Uh, I'd gone to gyms at different times and, you know, some, it just, it ne nothing quite clicked. And, you know, the really big guys were just absolutely intimidating and scary to me. And it was kind of hard to be around, which, you know, it's my own poor self image and all. But, and then in middle age, you know, I was the middle aged guy who would join the gym, who was on the elliptical and never lost any weight, who would pump iron, but never got any stronger. And I was just sort of there and I sort of resolved, well, maybe that's how it is. And, so I got to be about 53 years old, and I decided I wanted to get in shape when I was 20, 30, 40, and 50. And by God, I'm going to regret something else when I'm 60, but it ain't going to be this. <laughs> so I told my wife, I'm going to do something about this. And I found, a, found this guy online, one of those 12-week transformation challenges sort of things. Uh, he was just starting out, but he was a fellow Texan like I am. And I said, okay, this is a good old boy, so I'll trust him. I think it cost me 300 bucks, but he wrote out the workouts. He wrote out the diet. I got it all on Excel spreadsheets, you know, what I could eat, how much, put it all in, all the numbers, you know, calculated out for me and everything. And for the first time in my life, the fat started coming off and I got, I started getting stronger at the gym and I, I lost about 13 pounds with him over 12 weeks and uh, the, it ended. And I said, you know, I wonder how far I can take this. Who around, I work real well with a deadline. So I said, I'm going to do a contest. They had just come out with this thing called men's physique where you can wear board shorts. Mm -hmm. And I figured I could probably do that. So I said, who around here does coaching, you know, for contests? And one name came up and um, uh, I found Ramey and he runs most of the contests in Michigan. And so I went down and I said to him, I, I said, this is, you know, what can we do? <laughs> and he told me, I says, I can't guarantee that you'll win, but I can make sure you look like you belong on stage. And I said, that's fair enough. So we picked the very last contest of the year, which was, I think, like November 4th. We had like five months. And he wrote my workouts. He gave my, me my diet. In the course, ultimately, in the course of 10 months, I lost 40 pounds. I lost eight inches off my waist. I went from 23 to 8% body fat. Um, during the course of this, my self-confidence... All of the women in my life quit giving me so much shit, and I got a lot more respect from the men. <laughs> Had I known that would be one of the first benefits, I might have done this decades ago. <laughs> you know, it was it was incredible. And so it was absolutely life-changing for me. So I, I, I told my coach, I says, I don't need to win. I just don't want to be last. And I was fifth out of six. And so I did not come nice. in last. But... I got bit by the bug. I loved the prep. I loved the contest. I loved hanging with the guys backstage. And so I started competing. So I've over the last eight years, I competed 11 times. Uh, I lost my second show. I, I was last third in my third show. I was last in my fourth and fifth. And I think my sixth show. But seven, eight, nine, and 10, I won. I was winning state-level shows. 
Granted, geezer category, you have to understand, I, this is not open. I'm not competing with the young bucks. You know, this is old guy category. But I could hold my own. And so even last a year ago, last September, I went to nationals for the first time where I came in third and sixth or last and last. Um, but I qualified and went to a national level bodybuilding contest. And I gradually went from men's physique to classic physique to actual actual bodybuilding, which is where I, I'm, I'm happy to compete. And so since I was not quite big enough to go to nationals, coach and I decided we'd take a whole year off where I would do what I could to put on as much size as I can, which, as I say, at 61, you know, it's glacially slow at this point. But I see a little bit of improvement and I occasionally hit a PR in the gym still. So that's OK. And so I'm in prep now. I'm off season. I have just over a year before I'll go back and I'll, I have to qualify at a state level show. And then I will go to nationals probably September of next year. And we'll see if I can win. And if I do, I get my pro card, uh, which would be like a lifelong dream. Wow. So that's it. I use it for, um, I've spent so much time in my head. I've gone and got the PhD in church history. You know, mm -hmm. I, I, I love to study. So I've done a lot of stuff in my head. I've done a lot of stuff work spiritually, but I'd never done a lot of work physically. And so for me, it was sort of a, a whole you know, aspect of life that I'd never really emphasized very much. And I found I really liked sort of the groundedness and the embodiment sort of aspect. You know, I tell you what, it's real hard to concentrate on life problems when you're deadlifting 315 pounds, you know, sort of focuses the mind. And somehow you come out of doing that and you're just a little calmer and life's a little sweeter. And, you know, I found I really enjoyed it. So I, I like I like the process. I like working out. I like pumping iron, and it's not just you know the the, the contest prep. God, I I get crotchety and 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 the diet is is murderous and you know <laughs> uh, I get literally starved to perfection. This is beyond dieting for those contest guys. This is a yeah, controlled yeah. starve, yeah. and uh, it's murderous to do. But I can do it, and I gotten down to five and a half percent body fat. Wow. Uh, which is incredible for, you know, for a former fat boy. So <laughs> uh, it, it can be done if, if you want to do it, but it's a hell of a lot of dedication. And I just sort of use it as my ascetical discipline. You know, it's just another discipline thing that I do every day. I go to the gym. I, I have a progressive workout. I try very hard to hit my numbers, not to miss any days at the gym. It's on my battle plan too. You know, so I have further accountability that way. Um, but man, I just love it. And the way it fits into the, to, to, you know, to my ministry, I get all these, all these young guys lift. Okay. Or most of them do. And so when they read on, you know, I, it's in my bio on my parish website, you know, that if I'm not at the church or not having coffee with someone, I will be at the gym pumping iron. And they see that and say, I can talk to this guy. Yeah. So, you know, they come in and, you know, one of the first things I, I see some young, some young buck come in and, you know, and, and I'll say, bro, do you even lift? You gotta, <laughs> you gotta come to church and you've gotta lift, you know? <laughs> and, so, okay. and, you know, the fact that I can say that to them, it's an instant report. We already have something in common. And uh, we talk as much about, about pumping iron at coffee hour as we do about spiritual stuff. And in addition to that, there have been two men, one in my parish and one outside who have each lost over a hundred pounds because of my witness. And I had a 73-year-old grandma who started going to Planet Fitness a couple of years ago because she saw how much better I, I felt and was. And it was just a witness. So I've helped actually, and those are just the ones that come immediately to mind. I know there are a lot of people who have improved their lives physically and improved their health and their mental health as well because of the witness that I've given. There is so much to unpack there. That, that's an awesome story. The 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 word structure again comes to mind. You know, you yeah. talked early on in that about how the programming and the diet and all that. And, and mm -hmm. that is something that men, again, we crave structure. We crave yeah. challenge. We crave a deadline and, um, and the ability to use it as a tool to facilitate conversation and, and relationship mm -hmm. with other men, I think is a strong, a strong tool in your arsenal. Uh, yeah. It's worked. It's worked really well, particularly with the demographic that's coming to the church now. Uh, yeah. It won't always be that way. Uh, I do have a number of people in the church who find it absolutely unthinkable, <laughs> you know, to imagine me, who's usually in, you know, floor length, full cassock or floor length vestments, you know, wearing a little scrap of spandex. <laughs> and, 
for them, it's too much of a jump and they really don't want to hear about it. So I say almost nothing about my workouts or my competition in church. I never, it doesn't come up in sermons or anything like that. But when I find one on one, when I find some young guy or someone else who I know works out, I say, Father, how's the workouts going? Mine's going great. You hit that, you hit that deadlift PR that you were working on. Yeah, I did. You know, and it, it's, it's just another way of linking up with guys and you can see, no, you don't have to be an emaciated, you know, 40 days on bread and water, you know, kind of Christian in order to, yeah. Follow. yeah, we, we spent a lot of time talking a lot about the, the symmetry and the, there are a lot of parallels with getting in shape and taking care of yourself and what it means to be a good man. We, we, we espouse this idea that it's pretty paramount and pretty vital to really truly being a great man and you're an incredible testament of that and the big the biggest takeaway of all of that is you found you there were so many times in your life you could have said i'm just the fat boy Uh, i've just committed my life to the priesthood i don't need to take care of myself physically you easily could have told yourself that you were never complacent you started at 53 years old which is incredibly inspiring thank you never too late yeah and the story on that is guys follow your dreams early, you know, don't, you know, it's, it's become a refrain with me. I think my battle team's tired of hearing me say it. Failure is pretty damn bitter, but regret is 10 times worse. And don't put off your dreams, you know, until you're too old to follow them. You know, I look back, I, it, it's, it's sort of hard for me to go to the gym these days because almost all of my friends who compete are all competing this year. So they're all in contest prep. They're shredded, man. You can see their hearts beat through their shirts. They're so lean, <laughs> you know, and they just look absolutely fantastic. And I go in and granted, I'm, I'm pretty damn strong right now, but I look like a potato. <laughs> you know, <laughs> all gray, fat and ugly is kind of how I feel a lot of times. Um, and I just have reminded myself, no, had I started at 20, had I started at 30, I could have, I might could have looked like that, you know. So you just learn to thank God that he's made people beautiful and that, uh, you know, your friends are able to do as much as they can. And you try to be grateful about it uh, as well and not be envious. Yeah. I'll say this about Father Michael, too. You know, he's being pretty humble with regards to his looks and his strength. I've, if you follow him on Instagram, you know that... <laughs> He's putting up some pretty good numbers, and uh, I say this with all due respect. It's old man goals for me in terms of what you're doing in the gym. So there you are, there you are. <laughs> yeah, I did. I, I hit. I hit. I, I rarely try for PRs because my coach has drilled into me at at my age. The tendons get a little brittle, and the risk of tendonitis is really great. So yeah. I never do anything for less than five reps. If I yep. can't get five reps, don't lift the weight. Yep. And that's typically what I do. But I was feeling really good about a month ago. So I, I hit a PR on deadlift. I did 375 and I hit a 255 bench. And I thought, all right, that's that's like 10 pounds better than than when I tried a year ago. And they both look almost easy. So I'm sure I could do more. But that 375 uh, no, deadlift looked real easy. Yeah, it was I really did. bad form. <laughs> and I, I'm embarrassed by how bad my form was. But damn it, it's a PR. I've got to post the picture anyway. You know? And sure enough. Uh, I have two coaches, one who's one who does my contest prep and one one who writes my workouts. And the one who writes my workouts is a power lifter with holding national records. Mm-hmm. He's also a, a medical doctor in Chicago. And he saw that and he said, we need to have a video chat. That was awful. <laughs> <laughs> so I got a video call with him and he, and, and he went over a good deadlift form. So I never do that again. <laughs> oh, oh, man, that's that's amazing. Uh, and I don't know, as as I think of all of this coming full circle, here you are spending time in the gym to make you a better man, a better husband, a better father yep. to not only your children, but also to your to your congregation. Mm-hmm. And that in and of itself is the very definition of masculinity, how you continually raise the bar for yourself so that you can give unto others so that they hopefully can in turn go and do the same. Oh, yeah, that's it. That's it. You put it well. Thank you. No, thank you, Brad. You got anything else for? No, this has been here? this has been an enlightening and inspiring, just fun conversation. So absolutely, Michael, I've, thank you. I really enjoyed this, Father Michael. Thank you for yeah, joining this, us. This was fun. Thanks, thanks for asking me on. So we're going to wrap up the show here. Thanks again, Father Michael, for joining us. Uh, we will have show notes posted on untamingmasculinity.com where you can find links to 
Anything we mentioned in this show, as well as all of our other shows, we'll also have contact information for Father Michael. Um, just so you guys know, he's got a great YouTube channel, or not YouTube, Instagram channel, uh, Average to Alpha, AVG, the number two alpha. That's uh, that's fun to follow. He's got a bunch of reels on there that, that I enjoy on an almost daily basis. So definitely check him out there. And then you can also check us out. You've got uh, the Untaming Masculinity Instagram, as well as Brad and I's personal so reach out to us, hit us up, let us know how you, uh, what you liked about this episode and what we can do to improve it. Otherwise, we ask that you go to your podcast player and just leave us a rating and review. If you really liked it, give us five stars. If you hated it, let us know too. That'll help us improve. Other than that, we thank you guys for listening and we'll leave it with just one question. What are you doing to untame your masculinity?